Hello fellow fishers and happy 23rd day of my February fish vlogs. Today's video is kind of a two for one. I'm going to not only reveal another strain of guppy that I got um, from my uh, from the uh, big fish deal weekend that I picked up the fish from my local fellow fishner friend which the video you see behind me is the fish that I revealed in yesterday's video. Post a link to that video right up in the top right hand corner. And uh, so anyways, go check that video out if you wanna watch that. Pretty exciting stuff. Those fish had babies and uh, my students really enjoyed seeing the babies, the first babies, the first fish fry of my, uh, not, that sounds like I'm cooking them. That was the first babies baby fish to be born in my classroom all year, which is kind of sad. But the kids were excited. I told them at the very end of class, because I knew that once I told them, like, they wouldn't be able to focus on anything else. And they all got up and uh, at the very end of class and looked at them, and they were all excited about them. They're like, wow, they're so tiny. Well, yeah, they're not going to be huge. They're babies. I mean, they come out of a fish that's, you know, fully grown that big. They're not going to be but so big. And they were really shocked about the size of their eyes, how big their eyes were compared to the rest of their body. Uh, that, that that is pretty interesting, I, I um, agree. So uh, that is why I put it in that breeder box um, in in that tank. I usually don't do breeder boxes, but for the sake of my students, I did put them in, in a breeder box. So um, the other part of today's video, on top of the fish reveal, is at the request of the Bearski Method. I'll post a link to his channel right here the top right hand corner of the video um he posted a comment on my video yesterday and asked me to explain the difference between phenotype and genotype and uh which you know that was a good request but what really sold me was when he said that he was going to show the video to his his kids so the teacher and me obviously couldn't pass up an opportunity to teach uh students to teach young minds and and uh young at heart minds Heart, minds, that sounds kind of weird. Young minds at heart. Some, anyways, young and old. Minds young and old. There we go. Let, let's just say what it is. Minds young and old. So that's the second part of tonight's video. I'm super excited about that. I'm trying to figure out how to do all the editing and stuff and make it look really cool, like a really cool science lesson, um, as useful as possible. Although it's not in my content anymore of what I teach, uh, it is what I used to teach as far as life science goes, and it, I do enjoy the life science content a lot. It's my favorite science content to teach, uh, so I do enjoy it. I do miss it. Uh, my current science content I teach is things like weather and um, space and atoms, so it's not really a lot of tie-ins with fish stuff. So when I have the chance to teach a life science lesson tied in with a fish, course I'm going to take an opportunity. So the Bearsky Method and the Bearsky Method kids, this video is for you. Hope you enjoy it. Hope you learn something. If you have any questions, just post it down below. Um, also, the Bearsky Method, if you just want to find me on anybody, you want to find me on Facebook and ask me science questions, um, go for it. Find my Facebook page, message me on there. Um, I'm usually pretty good about replying back to Facebook messages. Also, um, if you have any requests for videos or questions or science lessons you're interested in, just put that in the comment below because I really, you know, love the opportunity to share a science lesson with my, uh, with my, my viewers and, and anyone that wants to learn. So hope you enjoy it. Hope you learned something and uh, I hope it's somewhat edutainment. I'll see you on the other side. It's Mr. Science Geek. I hope my tanks don't leak information that you seek be sure to tune in each week and my videos take a peek my singing and my jokes really read all right all right so the fish that you see here on this side of the screen um so uh from on this side of the screen uh we're gonna take the females from this side so this is going to be the 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 mother in the uh Mendelian uh, Punnett Square cross. Um, I'll explain that later. And then 
let me switch over to the other side. The guppies on this side, we're gonna take the males, because I think these males look a lot cooler. And also, in theory, the males on that side, because their gonopodium is so fancy, in theory, I haven't tested it out yet, experimental versus theoretical science. So in theoretical science fish terms, the guppies, the male guppies on that side are not going to be able to breed because their gonopodium is too fancy. We're going to take the males from this side because they are a more uh, practical male. Um, and so we're going to take their, their genes. So this is, these are the males because we do not see the uh, fancy long fins in their traits in their physical traits or phenotype and the appearance of a gene. For example, uh, I have blue eyes, that is a phenotype. Uh, the gene is whatever it is on my DNA, that is the genotype. The phenotype, blue eyes, I'm also left-handed, that's a genotype, that's how it showed up physically in, in me. I have light brown hair, darkish blonde in the summertime, not right now, obviously. So. Um, but that is phenotypes, the physical appearance of the gene. The genotype is what it looks like on the genetic level, and that's what we're going to test out in a Punnett square. So phenotype, physical, genotype, gene, and you can test it out theoretically in a Punnett square. So mother, father, male, female. Got your tickets to the gun show. I'm just kidding. I just that's what it looked like to me. All right, all right. Here we have the Punnett square for the um, the two guppies that we're going to theoretically breed, and possibly later on down the line, later on down the road, I am going to experimentally uh, breed or cross these two guppies. So we're going to take the male from the what I had on the right side of the screen previously, the father, and the female from the left side of the screen previously, uh, who has the uh, fancy long fin, uh, long anal fin. And we're gonna give the, for the, the sake of this punch square, we're gonna symbolize it with the letter G. Now, big G, uppercase G, is going to uh, represent the dominant trait. Uppercase letters represent the dominant trait. The dominant trait is the trait that covers up the other traits, and that is represented by an uppercase letter. A lowercase g is going to represent the recessive trait, or the trait that gets covered up usually. And in this case, it's the female from the left side of the screen earlier, and we know for a fact that her genotype will be little g, little g, as we see here, little g, little g, because the only way that a recessive trait can show up is if it is if its genotype is recessive recessive. Now, let me go back and explain why I'm choosing the letter G. It doesn't matter what letter you choose. You can choose G, Q, Z, whatever, it doesn't matter, but I'm choosing G for guppy, and I'm choosing G instead of F for fin, because G, uppercase G and lowercase G, look different enough to where it's not gonna get confusing. I could have chosen L for lace, uh, even though it's apparently not a lace fin. But for the sake of this punch square, we're gonna go with letter G, okay? So we put the fathers or the male genotype, which is the letter representation of the trait. It is the letter representation for what we suspect is on the DNA at the genetic level uh, a little section of the DNA double helix. Uh, is the letter representation of that. We're gonna put the male's, the father's genotype as big G, big G, uppercase G, uppercase G. Goes across the top. And we're gonna put the female, the mother's genotype for her fancy long anal fin as a recessive lowercase g, lowercase g, or little g, little g. Now, the genotype is the letter representation of the gene. The phenotype is the physical representation of the gene or of the trait, is how it appears. So, 
fancy fin phenotype, regular fin phenotype. Okay, so we're gonna cross these two, and it's just a matter of you line it, you bring it right across. You bring uh, the letter from over here, and you bring the letter from this column. Then you come over to this box right here, you bring down this letter right here, and you bring across this top letter over, over here. Then you go down to the next row, you bring in this letter over here, and then you bring down this letter from up here. And then on, in this box right here, you bring down this letter from right here and bring across, bring over this letter right here. So what we get is, do this in my head because I do this in front of a green screen. What we get is big G, little g, big G, little g, big G, little g, and big G, little g. Now, this Punnett square, <clears throat> I'm really excited about it, geeking out about it, because Gregor Mendel was an, uh, an Austrian monk, monk who lived in the 1800s. And he is what is referred to as the father of genetics. It's from Austria. It's my Arnold Schwarzenegger impersonation, the governator. Anyways, Gregor Mendel did a experiment in genetics on his pea plants in his garden at the monastery. And in his first experiment, in the first generation, what we refer to now as the F1 generation, he crossed a, uh, uh, two pea plants. He crossed um, a round uh, pea plant, which, he, which we later on know that it goes up here as the dominant trait. And then he crossed uh, a wrinkled pea Pod, wrinkled pea plant, which we now know to be as the uh, recessive trait. Now, in these boxes for these fins, the fancy fin versus the regular fin, we have big G, little g. If there's an uppercase letter, the uppercase letter wins. So, this, the chance of this one is regular fin. This one right here, regular fin. This one right here, regular fin. This one right here, regular fin. So in crossing this father, this father with the mother, um, in crossing the this male with this female, this regular fin with this fancy fin, this dominant trait with this recessive trait, which Gregor Mendel didn't know that yet, we get a 100% chance of their offspring, the F1 generation, to have regular fins. That's the first generation. That's Gregor Mendel's first experiment. He didn't have a Punnett square. Punnett came later and made a chart for us to be able to figure this out theoretically. Okay, so then you erase all this. Okay, forget all this. Well, kind of forget it. We're going to save a few things. So then what we're going to do is it's what we do in guppy breeding. It's called line breeding. And, and um, so that's what we're going to take two of the, the offspring that were previously in this Punnett square. We're going to take the big G, little g, and big G, little g. Take a male and a female, obviously. Put the male up here on the top of the Punnett square, big G, little g. Over on the side, big G, little g. Then we're going to just line them up. Bring down the big G. Bring over the big G. Yeah. Over here, bring down the little g, bring across the big g. Now, just so it looks nice, we're going to put the big g first, little g second, just for those people out there that actually care about uppercase letter going first. This bottom square down here, this is going to be big g, little g. This square over here is going to be little g, little g. Lowercase g, lowercase g. Now, <clears throat> this offspring, let's just say, the, the, the theoretical chance, so then the, the theoretical chance of the offspring from the F2 generation of having a regular fin is going to be, let me picture where the points were in my head because I'm doing in front of a green screen again. Okay is a 75% chance of being regular fin. 
because big G, big G, obviously that's the dominant trait showing up there. Big G, little g, the dominant trait wins, I'm sorry. Big G, little g, dominant trait wins, regular fin. And right here in the bottom right hand corner, we have a 25% chance that the offspring of the F2 generation will have a fancy fin, a fancy anal fin. So that right there is our 25% chance in the second generation of having the fancy fin. Now, in guppies, let's just say that we had 10 offspring, okay? I just had some fry, just had, I just had some fry, I had babies, no. I just had some guppies that just had some fry and they had 10 fry, so let's just go with 10. So, out of those 10, 25% is, is two, okay, not, you can't only have two and a half guppies, but let's just go with two. Okay, so two out of those 10 would be, in theory, would be the fancy long anal fin guppies. The other eight, approximately, actually be 7.5, but you can't split the guppy in half, but the, so the other eight would be the regular fin guppy. But six of those eight, I think I'm doing my math correctly here. Yeah, six of those eight would carry the gene for the fancy fin. They carry the possibility for future generations to have a fancy fin. So let's just say you get really lucky and these two out of 10 guppies that have the fancy fin are a male and female. And let's just say, theoretically, and I haven't practiced it yet in an experiment, that the fancy finned male is actually able to breed with the fancy fin female, which the fancy fin female is able to breed. There's, I don't think there's any question about that. Then, in theory, those two fancy finned guppies, little g, little g, as their genotype, would in theory throw or have or produce nothing but fancy fend fry. You like all that alliteration? They would have nothing but fancy fend baby fish. All their babies would have the fancy fen in theory. Once again, this is theoretical science. Experimental science, real life, is different. It doesn't always work out perfectly. But this was Gregor Mendel's second experiment. His second experiment was the second generation where he crossed the, um, the two offspring, which were both round. He crossed the round offspring with the round offspring. And he ended up getting a mix. He got um, mostly round and then one, 25% of the pea plants offspring were wrinkled. And that was how he discovered what the recessive trait was, was it showed up later on, it skipped a generation. Now, my own personal example of using the Punnett square, I'll just tell you this in story, I'll skip over the Punnett square, but this is how one of my traits is actually strange that it actually worked out in real life because human genetics is all just crazy if it goes according to theory not crazy it usually happens but it, you I wouldn't bet on it okay don't bet your house on it my I'm left-handed both of my parents are right-handed when I was a child and old enough to play golf my dad <clears throat> went to go uh, buy me golf clubs I don't play golf now and he got me right-handed clubs and then he discovered that I was left-handed and he said to my grandfather his dad he's like dad uh, my son is left-handed where did he get that from we're both right-handed and my grandfather said oh I'm left-handed my dad said to my grandfather, my pop-pop, he said, you're not left-handed, you're right-handed. My pop-pop said, no, I was born left-handed, 
but they switched me over when I was in school to be right-handed. So my paternal grandparents were left-handed and right-handed in genotype. Phenotype, the way it appeared to my dad, was their, they were right-handed, right-handed. So my paternal grandparents, my pop pop and my grandmother, who I had never met, um, their four offspring, my dad and my uncle and aunts, they were all right-handed. But apparently my dad carried the gene for left-handedness. My mom, she's right-handed. My maternal grandparents are both right, were both right-handed. My nanny and my grandfather, whom I never met. And they, apparently, one of them carried the gene for being left-handed. That's, that's how it obviously had to have happened at the theoretical level. So, therefore, my mom carried the gene for left-handedness, and my dad carried the gene for left-handedness. And when I was born, those two recessive genes lined up, and theoretically, there was a 25% chance that I was going to be born left-handed. Theoretically. Okay? So that's the way it happened. However, in real life, in experimental science, which is just human life, let's just say, we're not experimenting with humans, but in the application of this theoretical science, the way it usually works out is that 11% of the world is left-handed. 1 in 11 people, I think, or somewhere around that number, my ratio might be off. But 1 in 11 people are left-handed. Now, that's, that's, the, that's the thing. So the other thing is, is that when two right-handed parents have a child, that child has a 7% chance of being left-handed. Now, you're saying, what well, should be 25. Well, this is theory. The way it's worked throughout human history of left-handedness, when both parents were right-handed, 7% of the time, the child was left-handed. When one parent is left-handed and the other one is right-handed, then the child then has a, I think it's a 12% chance of how it's happened over a recorded history. When both parents are left-handed, which theoretically that should be, you know, recessive, 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 it should be 100% recessive, it doesn't work out that way. It actually usually works out to be 14% of the time the offspring, the children, are, are left-handed. Only 14%. It should be 100%. But left-handedness is so rare that that's just the way it goes. So... Hope you learned from this. I hope you enjoyed the application to you know my personal story. Um, I have my own theories about left-handedness too. They're 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 kind of crazy. But um, and then I hope you enjoyed the fish application of uh, Gregor Mendel's first and second experiment with the pea plants. In this case, it's guppies. Uh, guppies are a great uh, way to demonstrate Gregor Mendel's experiments because they uh, can reproduce and they have such a short uh, generation time. Uh, and you can test that, it's perfect. I, I love the Mendelian genetics in uh, breeding guppies. It's, uh, in the words of Corey, it's super cool, okay? Super nerdy, but super cool. So, to review the terms, phenotype, physical appearance of a trait, genotype, letter representation of the gene, uh, Punnett square is the box right here. And this was a simple one. This is just, this is the basic Punnett square. They, they do get more, uh, they do get more co complex. Also, I need to mention uh, heterozygous versus homozygous. Heterozygous is when it's dominant and recessive. That's heterozygous. Homozygous is when it's either do dominant, dominant, so uppercase, uppercase, or lowercase, lowercase. And then it could be homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. Okay. Once again, dominant is the trait that appears most often that covers up the other trait, and recessive is the trait that gets covered up and may appear later on in future generations. Once again, like I said, all of this all on here was theoretical. When it comes to the actual breeding of guppies and, and humans having children, then that's all experimental, which 
all bets are off the table. And as I say this video, I'm watching this right now, I'm looking at one of my super recessive, recessive traits. My wife loves to point out of my super freakishly attached earlobes, which thankfully my daughter at least did not get and my son did not get them either. They are crazy freakishly attached. My students always love to look at how attached they are. They're like, oh my gosh, you are a freak of nature. I'm like, I know. I have really recessive traits. Blue eyes, freakishly attached earlobes, straight thumbs, left-handed, super recessive. Uh, technically a straight hairline. It's, it's, it looks, it's curved, but it's, it's a straight hairline, so that's recessive. Um, curly slash wavy hair, I think is recessive. I might have that wrong. And um, oh, straight thumbs are also a uh, recessive trait as well. Usually the hitchhiker's thumb where it's curved back a little more, that's actually the dominant trait. So just a few examples of dominant versus recessive traits in humans. I am a walking recessive trait. Um, so, uh, another example, just one last example. I just love this example of uh, how <clears throat> in humans, uh, theory doesn't always work out because uh, I have blue eyes, my wife has green eyes, uh, both of which are recessive uh, eye colors, uh, rare eye colors in the case of my wife's green eyes. And uh, so theoretically, I have blue, she has green, in theory, both of our children should definitely have a 100% chance of having blue or green because they're both a recessive color. However, in humans, that doesn't always work out that way. There would be a chance that they would have brown eyes. It, it does happen. I have a friend who he has blue eyes, his wife has brown eyes, all their children have blue eyes, which that's theoretically possible, but and makes sense, but it's just, it's kind of crazy. Whereas my wife and I are both recessive, we should have a 100% chance of having children with um, recessive eye color, blue or green. But there is that chance, theoretically, that we could have offspring with brown eyes. Now, in the case of our children, the way it actually worked out was that practice, experimental practice in real life actually followed theory, and both of my children have blue eyes. So. I'm not going to go any further. This is the probably the longest video I've ever made, but I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you found it uh, edutainment tastic. That's not even a word. But if you have any questions, please post them down below. If you have any ideas for future videos for science lessons you want to have explained more, just post that down below. Um, like I said, the Bearski method made this request on yesterday's video, and I made the video for the next day. Like that's how quick um, I made the video request. Now. Future videos that will not be uh, February fish vlog videos uh, will not be that fast. They will be on a week to week basis because I will not be releasing videos every day, but possibly tw twice a week at the most. Maybe three times of filling extra special, extra, extra nice and extra giving. So hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. Stay tuned and stay busy people.